tonight we're going to have a wonderful time, especially as we look at how to turn our spare time into gold. How to turn our spare time into gold. I think uh, that in our world we need to learn this because it seems like people are feverish about their time. I was just reading about how two policemen off-duty in Los Angeles were uh, in unmarked cars and not in their uniforms, and, and one of them cut the other one off, and so they both got out, pulled their guns, and one of them killed the other one. Two policemen killed each other in L.A. because they were in a hurry. And I thought, that's amazing. We're, we're a little pressed for time these days. But starting in verse 17, and I just want to get us all together, and so I'll back up. Uh, we've learned, number one, that this book is how to live expectantly wherever you are. And these people were pagans before they came to Christ. They were idol worshipers. The, all they knew was the, the ancient Greek world's motto, which was live for the moment and live for the self and, and the flesh. And so the Apostle Paul, when the gospel came to them, first of all, explained to them in chapter 1 what it means to be born right, how to make sure you're in God's family. And, and chapter 1 has 17 elements, and we've looked at these of what genuine saving faith Faith is like he explains that to them chapter 2 he explains how he had nurtured them or discipled them and he says this is the way the proper way to be nurtured or discipled then bridging into chapter 3 and we're going to cover the first 10 verses of that he says I'll, I'll teach you how to be anchored right when we lived in Los Angeles we used to watch them build the skyscrapers we were there during the the 80s when they were just putting those things up as fast as they could just millions and millions of square feet of high-rise and what was amazing is, one half of the life of the building, you didn't see anything happening because they were going down. And they would, they would keep drilling and they would keep putting down all of these uh, uh, foundational things into the bedrock. And then all of a sudden, the building would go up so fast. And it was just breathtaking how fast it went up. But half of the time was spent below ground. And just getting all the, the attachments and all the water and the electricity and all the support systems ready. And then the, the building would go up. And that's what chapter 3 is all about. Getting anchored down so that you can mature and so that I can mature. So to teach this, the Apostle Paul, and we saw this uh, when we started this series last time, kind of gives a, a personal testimony starting in verse 17. He says in verse 17, But we, brethren, having been bereft of you for a short while... And what he's talking about is, and we saw this in Acts 17, he had to leave because he was kind of run out of town. The Thessalonians gave him a hard time, the pagan ones. And he had to leave, and he waited in Athens and had nothing to do. He just was on, on kind of layover, as we would have in an airport. And we already covered all that. But what he does, starting in verse 17, is he relates what he does in his spare time. Now, Paul was very organized. When he lived in, in uh, Ephesus, he, he, had every, he had rented a hall, the School of Tyrannus, it was called, and he would spend hours there every day dialoguing with people. He would just talk to them. He would reason, it says in Acts, uh, the book of Acts, chapter 19. He says he would reason all day long. He kind of lived a very scheduled life. But here he is, he finds himself, and we saw this last time in Athens. Well, what does he think about well, in verse 17, we saw the first element he thinks about, and the first way that we can redeem our time is to learn what the Apostle Paul says. He says, I remember you as beloved family, verse 17. But we, brethren, having been bereft, orphanen, we, we feel like we were orphaned without you. We love you so much. He says, even though you're out of sight, we still thought about you. And we saw already that in chapter 2, verse 7, the Apostle Paul says that he was like a nursing mother. And on Mother's Day, there's not a closer relationship than a mother and a nursing child. And he said, chapter 2, verse 7, he says, we proved to be gentle. We were like a nursing mother caring for her children. He said, that's how I look at the church. And boy, that's a great attitude to have. So Paul says, number one, in my in-between times, I think about you as a part of my family. Secondly, in verse 18 of chapter 2, he says, Satan thwarted us. And we looked at this concept that the second element of his spare time, he contemplated the spiritual battlefield. And, and I showed you this word thwart in verse 18. Um, at the end of the verse is ag coctane, which means to, to put a roadblock, to, to cut off the pass and to stop an army. And it's 
It's actually like an athletic word where someone cuts you off at the corner in a race. And what Paul said is, we should always be aware, even in our spare time, of Satan's activities. And I took you through all the verses last time that talk about it, that Satan in, in chapter 3 and verse 5 um, is a tempter. In 3, 5, he says, I fear thus the tempter have tempted you and our labor be in vain. We should pray for people that they would be preserved through temptation. Second Thessalonians 3, 3, the evil one is always marauding and trying to harm us. And we pray for protection for people from the evil one. Uh, 2 Corinthians 4, 4, Satan blinds people's minds. I mean, I, I have shared the gospel with people and had them really interested. And the next time I talk to them, they go, oh, I'm not interested in that anymore. And I know what's happened is Satan has come in and he's blinded their minds. And they, they can't even think anymore of what the gospel message is. In Ephesians 2, 2, he says that Satan is the, the one who is the prince of the power of the air that works in the sons of disobedience. And so we should be aware of Satan's devices and we should be aware of the battleground. Well... Then in verses 19 and 20, uh, we also saw last time that Paul thought, first of all, 17, he thought about family times. Secondly, in verse 18, he thought about the battleground. Thirdly, in verses 19 and 20, he thought about the homecoming. And I heard someone recently say, we're going to have a family reunion. And all these people, we're going to all come uh, in Texas and, and see our family we haven't seen in ages. Well, that's what Paul was thinking about. He says, you are, in verse 19, you are my hope. He says, that's my anticipation. You're my joy. That's my fulfillment. At my crown, that's my final victory. Paul looked at life and death, and he saw the ultimate joyous reunion of believers, of all the redeemed, of all the ages coming together. And he agreed with, and I believe Daniel said, and in Daniel chapter 12, uh, the prophet Daniel was thinking about this when he said these words, in Daniel 12, 1 and 2, um, at the end of 1, everyone found in the book will be rescued, and among those who sleep in the dust of the ground, they will awake, and these to everlasting life. And verse 3, those who have insight will shine brightly like the brightness of the expanse of the heaven, and those who lead many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. And like Daniel said, the Apostle Paul says, you are our glory and our joy. Verse 20. So those were what he thought about in his spare time. Let's finish off uh, the rest of them. Look in verses 1 through 8 of chapter 3, because Paul saw that these people had needs. And I think that's something we need to focus on ourselves. When we look at, at people, uh, people in the church, people that are in your Sunday school class, people that are in your youth group, or people that are in your ministry, or people that are in your fellowship group and flock, and when you look at them... This is what we should see through the eyes of the Scripture. Number one, verses one and two, and, and these are wonderful. Number one, we should realize people basically need encouragement. Encouragement. If you want to have a great ministry, encourage people. Just go around encouraging people. Just make it a habit. Look what Paul says. Therefore, when we could endure it no longer, we thought it best to be left behind at Athens alone, and we sent Timothy, our brother, and God's fellow worker in the gospel to strengthen and encourage you. What does God's fellow worker, Timothy, do? He encourages. He encourages. He encourages. And what's amazing is that the apostle said, when I was, uh, could endure it no longer, he says, my heart was stretched to the limit. I loved you and missed you so much. I was kind of not able to go on. He says, I knew you needed encouragement. The apostle was encouraged by encouraging them. And I think about that, that, when the Apostle Paul thought of new Christians, he thought they need someone to come alongside of them and encourage them. Someone that will come alongside of them, and, and Paul says, I have no one like-minded. He naturally cares for your estate. He says he naturally loves and, and ministers to you individually. And, and there's something about that. Ephesians 4.29, if you want to keep your finger here and just turn back a couple of verses, this should be... Our, our banner over what we do. 429, let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only such a word is good for edification. Uh, and such as is good for uh, the need of the moment, that it may give grace to those who hear. When, when you and I have an opportunity to talk to someone, we should speak something that will be encouraging to them. Uh, it, it's a choice we make. We can, we can either see the wrong side or, or see the good side. And we can either uh, pull out, Thomas Hardy used to say, the, 
the ancient writer, he says, some people see the manure pile in every meadow. You know, I mean, they, they look out this beautiful meadow of grass and animals and flowers and bees, and they say there's manure. I mean, that's just how some people are. That's not an encourager. Um, that, that's something else, but it's not an encourager. He said, you need encouragement. Look at verse 3. He says, not only do you need encouragement, he says, you need enlightenment. Verse 3, so that no one be disturbed by these afflictions. For you yourselves know that we have been destined for this. When someone is struggling, when they're, they're going through a hard time, when people are picking on them, when, when their, their fellow workers are, are resisting them, when their employers are resisting them, when, when school friends are resisting the gospel, he says, I don't want them to be disturbed because we have been destined for trouble. Remember what Job said, like sparks fly upward? Our days are to be filled with trouble. Verse 4, he, he just kind of expands on this. For indeed, when we were with you, we kept telling you in advance that we were going to suffer affliction. And so it came to pass, as you know, we should accept suffering from God. And if someone doesn't know that, we should encourage them. We should enlighten them. We should tell them that affliction comes with the gospel. Uh, they should see that, that Paul inherited a legacy of suffering for the kingdom. And, and it says that the Apostle Paul, that no one should be disturbed by these afflictions, that they should learn to be immovable, that they should, should take affliction not as an accident, but as a necessary part of life. Now, keep your finger here and look how Peter talked about this. First Peter 5, um, verses 6 through 9. Because the Apostle Peter uh, talks about this affliction that comes in life. And he says there that, that it's necessary part of our life. 1 Peter 5, starting in verse 6. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you. Cast your anxiety on him. He cares for you. Be sober, verse 8. Be on the alert. Your adversary is prowling like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. But resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same experience of suffering are being accomplished by your brethren who are in the world. See, we're all fellow heirs. We, uh, we got the mailing, and many of you did in the prayer corps, about the, the suffering church around the world, how in the Sudan, they're actually, the Muslims are crucifying Christians. They say, Jesus was crucified, we'll crucify you too. And a lot of other horrible things that they're doing. We need to realize that, that we are partaker with them of affliction. Ours is much lighter than theirs, but we need to stand with them. Well, back to 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. Because they needed a, a final thing in verses 5 through 8. Paul said, I'm praying for you in my spare time. I'm praying for you, number one, that you be encouraged. Number two, that you be enlightened. And, and the way you enlighten people is you, you see in the scriptures truths of God. You pray for those to be in someone else's life and you share them with them. The Apostle Paul said they were suffering. He saw in the scriptures it was destined that they suffer. He shared with them that the Bible says that. That was a way that he enlightened them. But finally, in this little section, they needed endurance. Look at verse 5. They needed to resist the tempter. For this reason, when I could endure it no longer, I sent to find out about your faith for fear that the tempter might have tempted you and our labor should be in vain. So he sent Timothy to see if they were willing to resist temptation. Say no to the devil. Say no to their flesh. To, to say no to the world. And, and we have to learn to do that. We have to learn to say no and to, to resist. Remember God said in... in uh, 1 Corinthians 10, 13, that no temptation takes us, but such as is, has an open door of escape, that God knows we all are tempted the same, and he always makes an open door, so there's always an escape route. Uh, I like it whenever I'm in an auditorium and they bring the lights down, you can see those red you know, exit signs all come up all the way around. Every, every time I see that happen, I think about 1 Corinthians 10, 13, that God has made a way out for us when we're tempted. Secondly, in verse 6, they needed to have endurance in living their testimonies. Look at verse 6. But now that Timothy has come to us from you, he brought us the good news of your faith and love, and that you always think kindly of us, longing to see us as we also long to see you. You see, they were living testimonies. They just kept on living their life. They were loving Paul, even though he was gone. They were thinking kindly of their father in the faith. And they were just like they were when he left them. And that was a great blessing. And in verse 7, they were growing. For this reason, brethren, in all of our distress and affliction, we were comforted 
about you through your faith. They kept on growing. They well, weren't static. They continued in their faith in Christ. And, and you know what, what amazes me is that they didn't have a handy-dandy study Bible. That they didn't have apologetic books. They didn't have encouraging tapes. They just had a living faith, and they just kept growing. And I think that should encourage us because we have so much more. And verse 8, For now we really live if you stand firm in the Lord. They needed endurance, verse 5, to resist the tempter, verse 6, to keep up their testimonies, verse 7, to grow in faith, and verse 8, to stand firm. So you know what Paul did in his spare time? Remember, he's, he's in his layover time. He's sitting there at the Athens airport or wherever he was, waiting. And what was he doing? He was praying for his family. And when he was praying for his family, he was praying that, that they would be able to make it through the battle. And he was praying that, that they would be encouraged. And he was praying all of these elements here, that they would have endurance and that they would have enlightenment. But Paul also says this. Look at verse 9 of chapter 3. For what thanks... I mean, how would you like to have gotten this letter from Paul? For what thanks can we render to God for you in return for all the joy with which we rejoice before our God on your account? How long did he know him? How long was he there? He only he had only known them for maybe three or four weeks, five weeks. And look what he writes. He says, in that short of time, he says, there's so much joy. We rejoice before God because of you. Paul says, I'm thanking God for you. Why did he thank God? Well, look back at chapter 1, verses 9 and 10. Because he saw God's hand in saving them. That's why it's so important to get to know people's testimonies. Did you know I ask people all the time how they got saved? I like to share in that part of their life. In fact, we have the new members coming over this Friday night, uh, the next crop of new members. And, and I said, share a one-minute testimony. I like to hear as many testimonies. Not at 4.15 in the afternoon on this date. That's now we're not looking for, you know, to get this magic number. We're looking... Is God alive in your life right now? Has he changed you? And what Paul said is, he says, I saw God's hand. Look at verse 9. You turn to God from idols. You serve a living and true God. Verse 10, you're waiting for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, who's delivering us from the wrath to come. He says, that's your testimony. You have turned. You've turned from your former way to the new way. And he says, I've seen God's hand in saving you he also saw God's image implanted in them it says at the end of chapter 3 verse 9 you rejoice before our God did you know one of the the marks of of God likeness godliness Christ likeness is thankfulness and he says in verse 9 we rejoice through our God because of you we see thankfulness to God that you're continuing on, that you're grateful, your faith is in God. And he says, that, that is what I thank God for because his image is in you. He saw his account with God being blessed by them. You know, it, it's, it's just amazing how, how we measure things by uh, accrued value and by um, things that rise and appreciate in value. And, and that's so much a part of our life. I mean, people are always saying, boy, I got that for so much, and now it's worth this much, and I bought that piece of land, and, and some lady at a checkout counter said, oh, I wish I would have bought more land in Broken Arrow 25 years ago. I'd be loaded now. You know, it's worth so much money. And I thought how, how we place value on those things. But Paul differently placed value on people. And, and look at verse 9 again. For what thanks, this is chapter 3, verse 9, what thanks can we render to God for you in return for the joy for which we rejoice before our God on your account? The Apostle Paul looked at them as an investment he had made, and he was reaping dividends. Now, some of you are old enough to remember coupons on bonds. Uh, when I was young, People used to have bonds, and they would go down once a month, and they'd cut the coupons off and put them into the bank teller, and they'd give them their interest. They were clipping coupons on their bonds. Um, these were investments that they had made, and, and the big deal was to go once a month and cut your coupon off and get your, your investment back. Paul said, you are my clipped coupon. You are the one that, that your account is bringing joy for me. So Paul 
Remember them as beloved family. That's his first spare time thought. Secondly, in, in chapter 218, he thought about the battle they were in. Thirdly, he thought about homecoming, 219 and 20. Fourthly, he thought about his concern for their needs in verses 1 through 8. And he was concerned for their need of encouragement and concerned that they be enlightened and concerned that they endure. Fifthly, in verse 9, he says, I'm thanking God for you. And if you have spare time and if you want to be filled with joy, just start thanking God for believers. Just start wherever you want. Start with your Sunday school teachers. Start with, with one of your favorite uh, ministry leaders or with if you're leading a ministry with the people and start thanking God for them. You know, it's very hard to be negative when you're thanking and it's, that's what Paul does. He's in this in-between time. He says, I'm thanking God for you. Sixthly, what's his sixth spare time thought? In verse 10 of chapter 3, Night and day we keep praying earnestly. What is Paul doing? He's directing his prayers. It wasn't light prayer. It wasn't, now I lay me down to sleep stuff. It wasn't bless, you know, this meal stuff. Look at the word he uses at the beginning of verse 10. Paul had, he pursued very earnest prayer. Uh, New American says most earnestly. Um, King James says exceedingly. It's the word huper uh, ek parison, which huper and ek are both prepositions. And whenever you want to emphasize something, you take a word, parison, and you go ek, and that means I really mean it. But if you go huper and ek, it means I really, really mean it. They just added... Uh, prepositions on to show like underlining in, with your computer or bold and he says I am really very highly strongly this adverb it's, it's a, a very great earnest kind of prayer what does it mean? Well, in verse 10 night and day he said we really mean business when we pray for you and I have a little directory up here from when I announced it a while back. And I'll tell you, a wonderful ministry you can have. I mean, most of you have one of these. At least if you have your picture in here, you got one. You know, I, I page through this thing and kind of have a regular little route through here. And I just look at the pictures. And I pray for the people. I get done with this page, and I look at the pictures, and I pray for these people. Did you know that, that you can have a wonderful ministry at our church right from your your kitchen table in the morning or right from your bedside at night just by looking at the pictures and praying for people? You know, the Apostle Paul, he said he had that. He says, night and day we keep praying earnestly for you that we may see your face. Tell you what, you got your director, you can see their face. And pray for them. Did you know that what the most prayed for request in New Testament is for Christian togetherness? They just wanted to spend time together. Paul says, I want to see your face. Well, what's his last, last request in verse 10? There's seven of them here, and this is number seven. That we may see your face and may complete what is lacking in your faith. What is that? Does that mean they're defective? No. This is the whole concept of equipping uh, that's the word he uses. Listen to this. He had one final pursuit, one last spare time desire that filled his heart. He says, when I think about you, he says, I want to see you complete. I expect God to finish the job of equipping you. Now, God's the one that equips. We're a part of the process, but God is the equipper. And, and this is a very interesting word. It's the word carta torizo. It means to equip, to mend. And it speaks of nets being mended. Look, look in... Um, Matthew chapter 4, if I can find it. This word is there. I want to show you uh, this concept of equipping. It's much talked about. Yes, 421 in, in uh, Matthew 4. When Jesus called his disciples uh, and said, I'll make you fishers of men in 19 of chapter 4 of Matthew 20, they immediately left their nets. In verse 21, and going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James the son of Zebedee and John his brother, in the boat with Zebedee their father, Equipping their nets. Same word. They were sewing them together. They were, they were taking the parts of the net where too many fish had torn them, and they were rejoining those together. And sometimes when we think about equipping, we think about classes, and we think about knowledge. But you know what it is? It's mending and knitting together people. Equipping the saints for the work of the ministry. When saints are out doing the work of the ministry, the Holy Spirit has, has given them this equipment to, to use for the glory of God. But they get out there and they get bumps and they get tears and they get 
get holes and they get strains. And we need to come alongside each other and, and, and help sew each other back up. And that's what he's saying here. He's saying, I am praying that, that you will be made complete. And that word's used many times. Uh, keep going back toward Thessalonians and look at Galatians 5. From Matthew, if you want to get to Galatians 5, the same concept is, or excuse me, 6, that, that we should be bearing each other's burdens uh, in chapter 6 of Galatians. Uh, if you're caught in a trespass, restore such a one in the spirit of gentleness. It's the same idea. Restore. Come alongside of them. Knit them together. Sew them back up. Help them to, to not have holes in their spiritual life. And this is what Paul was praying. He says, I want you to be supplied. I don't want you to be behind in anything. He, he's saying in, in chapter 10 that, or I mean in verse 10 of chapter 3 of 1 Thessalonians, our text, night and day we are praying earnestly that you might be complete in what is lacking. And specifically what he's saying is that you, despite all of your achievements, that you would be able to finish the job, that, that your net would make it to be fruitful to the Lord. Well, what I like about this prayer and why I like to take time to do these verses from 2.17 to 3.10 is it showed me that nobody, nobody, no matter where they are, in the Christian life has arrived. We're all following after Christ. We're all on the way. And the Apostle Paul says, even for the people he personally led to Christ, and even for the people that he ministered to, he says, I practice my love for you by thinking about you as my family, by thinking about the war you're going through, by thinking about someday being in heaven with you, for specifically praying for your needs, for thanking God for you. And when I remember you, I thank Him for you. And for having earnest prayer for you, and specifically that you might keep growing to maturity. Well, that's Paul's prayer. Now, let me conclude with this, because I hear this all the time. People say, you know what, I'd love to do all that. I'd love to have that kind of praying. I'd love to take my directory and pray for the church. In fact, I'd like to read my Bible, but I just don't have time. How do we get some spare time to do all this stuff that I talked about, these seven things? How do we have time to think of our family and pray for people in the battle and think about going to heaven with them and think about their needs and thank God for them and support them and, and see them mature? Well, let me give you some suggestions. And you know what? These would work tonight. I was reading a, a, a man analyzing our culture, and I was caught by how he said that there's some simple little adjustments we can make in our life to change. And there are just a few of them, seven of them actually. I'll just read them to you. Seven keys to find spare time and turn them into gold. And I'll just read them to you, then I'll explain them. We need to start expecting unexpected things. Have you ever gotten frustrated because something unexpectedly came up? Just expect unexpected things and you don't get frustrated. Secondly, we need to learn to say no. And I'll explain that in just a second. Thirdly, uh, a real powerful thing is we need to turn off the TV more than we do already. Television is captivating and addicting. We need to turn it off. Fourthly, and I'll explain this one, we need to prune activity branches in our lives. Fifthly, we need to simplify our lives. Sixthly, we need to cut the chains of technology. Uh, for some of you, it would probably make you have the shakes, but you know what would be really neat? To take your beeper off and put it away, and to turn your cell phone off, put it away, and to turn off all the technology. In fact, you know what one author said that he does? He'll take a whole week and he won't wear his watch. I thought that was a fascinating idea. He says, I don't want to be bound by technology. He says, you know, people are just like this all the time. This is, this is, you know, they're just... It's really funny to watch them. It, I mean, have you ever been in a restaurant and, I mean, it, just the phones are ringing everywhere. And buzzers are going off and people are talking on the phone. They're, and talking to people around them, they're just on the phone and they're just frantic. You know, just let me finish that. You know, and they just, they can't stop. Seventh, we need to thin the calendar out. And I'll explain all these. Number one, expect the unexpected. We need to start spare time in our life by adding about 15 or 20 minutes to everything we're already doing and plan to do, and by that time, added between things, all of a sudden something will be over and something else isn't starting right on its tail. And if we just expect unexpected things and just put that little tiny piece of time in there, I mean, just like leave for church 15 minutes early. Wow. And you'll be here before everybody else, and then when everybody comes, you can greet them. Rather than, 
you know, racing to get here and being out of breath and being upset because nobody's just come 15 minutes early or something like that. Secondly, learn to say no. There's so many good things in life, we have to say no to some of them every day. We already know how to say no to the bad stuff. Say no to the good stuff, too. We can't do everything. We can't be all things to all people all the time. We just have to work. We have to have time for God. And we have to have time for our family. We have to do our jobs. And everything else comes after that. Just say no. Just practice. Stand in the mirror and go, no. 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 And smile when you do it. Just say no. And, and just don't do everything. It's okay to say no. You know, you know it would be wonderful to see in the church. I think we have too many activities in the church. I mean, personally, myself. Uh, I like to be home four nights a week with my family. I think it's wrong to be gone all the time. I, what really bothers me is all my neighbors. They stand on the sidewalk. They watch us come and go. You know, they want to talk. Did you know I find them waiting for us to get home and they run out of their house and they'll come over to talk to us. They want to talk to us. They know we're different, but we're never home. And I wonder if you're home. And we need to say no to things and, and stay home. And, and not just minister everybody else, but minister our own families. Number three, turn off the TV. Uh, I know that, that we say no to it a lot, but most Americans spend 15 to 30 hours in their week with a TV on. And you don't even have to watch it. If it's on, it's distracting and it's in the background. It's wonderful to turn it off. And we should be abnormal. Turn it off. And the radio, for that matter. You just don't need noise. God says to be still, to know that I'm God. Sometimes there's too much noise in our lives. Listen to this. I like this. One writer said, we need to prune activity branches. They compare life to a tree. And we have this big limb, our family. And we have this big limb, our job. And we have this big limb, our church. And we have another limb, our neighbors and relatives. But from each of these limbs grow little branches of our commitments we make to those areas of life. And as our lives go faster and faster, there are more and more little branches coming off until our whole tree is just so full we have no spare time. And this author says that they regularly take in their big loppers, you know, and they cut off as many branches as they can, and they just start pruning them back, even when it's painful, because we do so much extra at work and at church and so on that we can't, as Mary, choose the better part. If you find yourself struggling to rest in the Lord, then you need to get out the loppers and lop off branches. Not limbs. We have our commitments. But it's all those little things that we branch out and do. Simplify. That's a fifth area to get spare time. Cut back on the complexity and the maintenance of things. And, and that's something that, that we as elders, we start talking about. Did you know that, that in a church like ours, we spend so much time just maintaining? We're not going forward, we're just maintaining you know, we, we have all these groups. They meet just to talk about maintaining what we have. And in the early church, they didn't do that. They didn't have any paper. They didn't have faxes. They didn't have committee meetings. They were just all out with people serving the Lord. And we have kind of institutionalized, so we talk more about ministry than we do a lot of times. And it's so important that we simplify. If we spend all our time with things, how can we find time for the only part of life that lasts forever? People. Simplify the complexity. And then this is the one I mentioned, cut the chains of technology. We easily get under the control of our tools. Try to turn or take off your beeper, your cell phone, your clock, your alarms, your faxes, and your telephones for a whole day. And just try it. Just see what happens. And then, just as fasting from food purifies our body, we'll learn that fasting from technology purifies our souls and purges the restlessness we pick up from society. Uh, there's an obsession. I, I have friends in the East that, that they can't start the day without checking the weather channel for 45 minutes. They want to know what the weather is everywhere. I mean, you go to work with them. Do you know what's doing in Amarillo today? I say, no, I don't. Oh, I do. Did you know that, that Yellowstone had the lowest temperature on the continent today? No, no, I didn't know that either. You know, what good does it do to know all that? I mean, wouldn't it have been great to have not watched the weather channel and just read the Bible and to know something that won't change? And the weather changes really quickly. And, and that's part of our, we don't need to uh, know everything. Um, even the news, so much of the news is useless. And finally, thin the calendar. Did you know that anticipation enhances enjoyment? We have so many things going in our lives in America today that we don't have time to anticipate anything. We're just like this. 
just back to back, just doing stuff. It, it used to be in the old days that people would anticipate all year long a special event. And then, after they experienced it, the memories were sweet as they relished them. Over and over, they just kept rethinking. We do things so close together in our lives in America today that we don't have time to anticipate them, we don't have time to remember them. That's why we take so many pictures. So we have, and take videos. Because it goes by so fast, if we don't take the videos and pictures, we won't even remember what we did. You know, if you slow down, you can look forward to something for a long time, and then you can look back on it and enjoy it. Thin the calendar. Too many back-to-back -back events drowns the anticipation and dilutes the memories. And maybe we need to be like the Apostle Paul, who just sat down, and he says, I don't have to win all of Athens today. I'm just going to sit down, and I'm going to think about my friends in Thessalonica. He says, and I'm going to think about them because they're my family. I'm going to think about them because they might be involved in battles for the Lord. And I'm going to pray for them because I know I'm looking forward to seeing them. I want to see them complete in heaven. I'm going to pray for their needs. I'm going to thank God for them. And I'm going to pray earnestly for them that they will be mature. I'd encourage you to take your directory out next to your Bible this week and pick out some people that you don't know and pray for them. And you know what? God will do something in their life because of what you and I ask for. And you know what's really neat is to bump into someone whose picture you've been praying for. And the first time you bump into them, you go, I've been praying for you. And they'll go, thanks. Where are you in the directory? You know, and, and they'll pray for you too. And we'll see what God does as we turn our spare time into gold for him. Let's bow for a word of prayer as we're dismissed tonight. Dear Father, you are our Father. You love us just like we are. You see us as we shall be. You fill us to overflowing. You offer us everything, all the treasures that are hidden in Christ. And you just said you, you have to just come and get them. Help us to prune and thin and cut and simplify and turn off whatever we need to do to slow our lives down so there's time for people and most of all time for you. And Father, especially as we look at the summer months, may we not fill them so full that we can't anticipate some great events and then savor those great events. Help us in our lives as a family to focus together on that which is the better part. Thank you for Paul. Thank you for the model, for the example, for the insight he gives us. Help us to turn our spare time into gold for your kingdom, we pray. And all God's people said, Amen.